Hi everyone, uh, this is the uh, uh, lecture for uh, Physics 112, uh, Thursday, April 9th, and also for Physics 102, uh, but uh, Wednesday, uh, April 8th, and the Monday, uh, April 13th. Uh, the Friday class is, is canceled because of uh, Good Friday. Okay, so uh, we're starting a new topic. Uh, today we're going to be talking about electricity and magnetism. And uh, the notes are online on our Moodle site. I've already logged in. Uh, and if you're in Physics 102, uh, if you scroll all the way to the bottom here, you'll see the notes right here. So you can see here April 13th, I'm uh, sorry, April 8th and April 13th. And if you're Physics uh, 112, uh, we can go to that site and here are the notes there. They're the April 9th notes. Okay, so uh, they're both identical. Uh, they don't involve any uh, calculus, so there's uh, no reason to separate out the two courses. Okay, so um, what is electricity and magnetism? All right, uh, well, um, let's ask a more uh, deeper question. Uh, um, uh, what kind of forces are there, or what are the fundamental forces in the universe? And you remember last semester, uh, I had to introduce forces because I introduced uh, Newton's laws. Okay, and in Newton's law, you know, the second law being the most important, F is equal to ma, you have to know what a force is. And at that time, I told you that a force is anything that is a push or a pull. All right, so um, that's that's what a force is. But you could ask the question: Are can you can you kind of enumerate all the different forces in the universe? And we kind of did that when we were doing our problems. When we were drawing those free body diagrams, we would identify a, a frictional force. We would identify a normal force, gravity pulling down, and so on tensions and strings and so on and uh, you know we were enumerating the forces but uh, you know uh, if you want to enumerate them you've got to go all the way down to the microscopic level and say uh, you know what are these forces um, uh, at the microscopic level and are there fundamental forces in the universe and the answer is yes it turns out that there are four fundamental forces in the universe and that the forces that we studied last semester uh, they were at the macroscopic level meaning you know th between objects that you could see and feel you know which uh, you know, have about one mole of, of matter in them like 10 to the 23 particles but if you go down right down to the microscopic it turns out that both friction and the normal force for instance are both because of electricity and magnetism okay and uh, you know, that's because the atoms are touching one another. When atoms touch, that touching is basically an electrostatic uh, force between them. Okay, and so uh, you know when you go right down to the microscopics and you study um, what causes these pushes or pulls, you discover that there's only four different types of forces that exist. Okay, well the first one we we did study in some detail and uh, that's gravity and uh, gravity is uh, very important at the cosmological level because it's basically what holds planets together it's what holds solar systems together it's what holds galaxies together and so on and you know if there were no gravity not only would you float away from the earth but the earth itself would come apart because what's holding the earth together is like one part of the earth gravitationally attracts another part of the earth and that causes you know all the pieces of the earth that kind of like pull towards one another and makes a nice little ball. So if you turned off gravity, you would float away, but the earth itself would kind of like start to fall apart because there'd be nothing holding it together. So planets are to held together by gravity. Uh, the solar system is held together by gravity. You know, the earth orbits the sun because of gravity. The moon orbits the earth because of gravity and so on. Galaxies are held together by gravity. Uh, and so it's, it's an important force at the cosmological level. Uh, it's the only force which is purely attractive. OK, and that's actually why it's important at the cosmological level, because it's not like you can add more stuff and take away from the force of gravity. As you keep adding more matter, the force of gravity can only get more and more and more because it's just adding like a bunch of positives. You, you cannot you cannot create anti-gravity. There's no such thing as anti-gravity, which would subtract away from gravity that's already there. So it just keeps building up, building up, building up. OK, so that's the story with gravity. Uh, and the force that we're going to study uh, in this section is electricity and magnetism. OK, uh, so uh, electricity and magnetism, they are related, although at first they seem that they're not. And I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but basically, this is the force which is responsible for holding matter together at the microscopic level. So if you have any solid material, uh, you know, when you go down to the atomic level, well, you know, there's a nucleus and then these electrons are orbiting the nucleus. OK, well, they're actually like they're actually forming these standing waves because they're quantum mechanical particles. But, at, you know, at some at some kind of naive way, you can think about the electrons as orbiting the uh, the nucleus. And just like the sun keeps the Earth orbiting it because of gravity, the nucleus keeps the electrons orbiting because of uh, the electrostatic forces. OK, and um, 
so the atom is held together by uh, uh, by electricity and magnetism. And then two atoms are stuck together, say uh, like H2, you know, they're stuck together because of the cold valent bond. That's also electricity, uh, an electrostatic force. And then all, all the kinds of bonds that you have in organic chemistry, those are all electricity and magnetism at play and so on. And so uh, basically all of matter uh, is built up. Uh, by, from the electrical force. And of course, if you've got a solid, then you have an entire lattice of atoms that extends right out to the macroscopic level. And if you see any solid object in your uh, vicinity, well, that's because the atoms are all being held together by uh, electricity and magnetism. Okay, and so um, there's the, the electrical force. Uh, it's much stronger than gravity, but it's not important cosmologically because it tends to cancel itself out. And again, I'll talk about that a little later when I talk about this phenomenon known as screening. Okay, so electricity is both attractive and repulsive, whereas gravity is only attractive. Okay, uh, there are two other forces which I'll mention just for completeness, um, because uh, um, you know might as well talk about all of them, but we won't study them in in the course. Uh, the other one, the next one, uh, the next stronger one is the uh, weak nuclear force. Even though it's called the weak nuclear force, it's stronger than electricity, but it's not as strong as the strong nuclear force. And it's responsible for things like the radioactive decay that occurs in materials uh, where, you know, like for instance, in radiation therapy, where, you know, uh, some radioactive material will emit like fast traveling electrons known as beta particles or fast traveling uh, helium nuclei known as alpha particles or else it'll emit gamma rays okay and so um, this this kind of uh, force is basically um, the due to the uh, weak nuclear force okay but then there's also the uh, strong nuclear force and the strong nuclear force uh, that's like atomic bombs or nuclear reactors okay uh, the strong nuclear force is like responsible for even holding a proton together the proton itself turns out to be made up of these three quarks okay and you wonder why don't the quarks fly apart okay well that's because there's a strong nuclear uh, force holding it together and then the quarks also interact the quarks with one proton even interact with the quarks of another proton and as you'll see in a minute positive things want to fly apart and so a very natural question would be why does the nucleus which is made up of protons which are positive and neutrons which are neutral why does it stay together like why don't the two protons just fly apart in the nucleus and the answer is is because they're being attracted by a stronger force the strong nuclear force okay and so when you start breaking bonds at the strong nuclear force level then we're talking like a tremendous amount of energy and that's when you get like atomic explosions or, or nuclear reactors a nuclear reactor is an atomic explosion which is being controlled very very um uh, it's it's a very slow acting atomic explosion. A lot of heat is generated, and then you use that to make electricity. Okay, so there they are, the uh, four uh, uh, fundamental forces. Again, if you look down at the microscopic levels deep enough, you discover that there, the universe has four fundamental forces. Gravity, which is the oddball because it's the one that's only attractive. Okay, then there's electricity and magnetism. Okay, a magnetism turns out to be a kind of electricity or is related to electricity, as we'll see later. And uh, there's the weak nuclear force and then there's the uh, strong nuclear force okay so uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's compare uh, electricity to gravity okay so uh, in in gravity the gravitational substance that is the stuff that's responsible for causing uh, gravitational attraction is mass Okay, and mass only comes in one variety, positive. Okay, uh, so you know, you say this thing has a mass of five kilograms, or that thing has a mass of seven kilograms, and there's no such thing as negative mass. Okay, you don't have like negative five uh, kilograms. That's that's nonsense. Okay, it's like uh, as soon as there's something there, it has positive mass associated with it. Okay, and uh, any two masses, like uh, there, I have drawn that seven kilogram blob and the five kilogram blob. They attract one another. Okay, so these positive masses, they only attract one another. Okay, and uh, there's the story with gravity. Okay, now with electricity, uh, uh, the electrical substance, the thing that's responsible for causing the electrical force is called charge. Okay, and it comes in two varieties, and we could have called them whatever, but we tend to call it, we, we've chosen the names positive and negative. We could have chosen the names red and blue or something like that. Okay, uh, they're just two different varieties, and uh, you know, we call them positive and negative. Okay, and so for example, you can have a charge which is plus five coulombs. We'll talk about what a coulomb is in a bit. Okay, so plus five, or you can have another charge which is negative seven coulombs. 
okay and so you can have either positive or negative charges all right and it's both an attractive and a repulsive force okay and the way this works is uh, like charges will repel and opposite charges will attract okay so if you have a situation like this we have two positives the two positives will repel one another two negatives they will also repel one another okay so like charges will repel but a positive and negative they will attract all right and so there you go uh this business of uh you know having these two different types of uh of uh, uh substances which carry electricity uh you know that's just a property of electricity uh, of the electrical force when it comes out when it comes to something like the strong nuclear forces it turns out that there are three charges and we couldn't call them positive and negative we call them red green and blue okay and then there's also anti-red anti-green and anti-blue and so you know uh th this choice of positive and negative was kind of uh i wouldn't say arbitrary because it was inspired by math mathematics but you know it's it we didn't you know there's nothing there's nothing plus about the positive charges as we chose to call it that okay so um uh um let's get to this idea of screening whoops i scrolled too far let's get to this idea of screening uh so uh, uh even though gravity is the weakest force in the universe it turns out that it's really what holds the universe together okay and that's because as i mentioned earlier gravity only adds up it's only it leads to attractive and it's more attractive and more attractive. the more matter is there the more attractive it becomes and so what i have here is uh you know a picture of just a bunch of masses here okay these asteroids whatever okay out in space okay and here we have maybe another asteroid and uh these arrows here those are basically the forces of attraction it feels attracted to this mass it feels this this mass here feels attracted to that mass it feels attracted to that mass that mass that mass that it feels attracted to all of them so if you were to add up all those forces the net uh, the net effect would be to pull this mass in towards these other masses okay uh, whereas with electricity you can have positives and negatives and most matter is made up of approximately the same number of positives and negatives okay because the electrical force is so strong if you had way too many negatives or way too many positives you'll actually blast the material apart okay like you know if you put enough static electricity on something uh it, it the 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 material itself will will uh, break apart because the the negative uh say say you added a bunch of electrons it'll just want to fly off in different directions if that force gets big enough it'll tear the matter uh, apart so most matter most ordinary matter is made up of out of approximately the same number of positives and negatives it might have a little bit more negative in which case it's negatively charged or maybe a little bit more positives in which case it's positively charged but roughly speaking approximately the same number okay so over here we have ordinary matter and uh, uh you can see here i have three positives in this ordinary matter and uh, three negatives okay and now here's a positive charge it's sitting nearby and uh, it feels attracted to the negative so okay so i got three arrows here showing that the positive is being attracted to these three negative charges but at the same time it's being repelled by the three positive charges and so does this charge get attracted or repelled and the answer is both okay with a net effect that the charge doesn't really either get attracted or repelled from this blob of charges over here okay and so because electricity has both attraction and repulsion over a distance uh, it tends to just cancel out because a charge will just see as many positives around it as, as and as many negatives and it goes well I feel kind of neutral here I don't feel like you know being pulled one way or the other and so uh, you know the electrical force even though it's much much stronger than uh, than gravity will tend to cancel out whereas gravity only builds up and so that's why you know you're not going to have an electrical force holding planets uh, in place it's going to be gravity okay so this effect by the way is known as uh, screening and you might wonder why is it called that well just because if you think of like you know as you know if you've got a uh you've got like a charge out here and a charge here and you've got a whole bunch of like uh, positives and negatives in between well then the 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 any kind of attraction or repulsion between the two charges is basically screened by all the other positives and negatives around it okay and so uh there you go uh it, it kind of cancels out as a result you know it's not it's not that the, the force isn't there it's just that over large distances it tends to be screened out but over short distances it's pretty strong and that's exactly what touching is okay so yeah gravity is pulling me down into the earth but you know this, i'm sitting on my couch here uh, it's pushing me up and uh, at the short distances of touching 
uh, yeah, those electrical forces start to really build in, okay, because then you're no longer, you're no longer really screening, you've got the electrons of one atom pushing up against the electrons of another atom, and the repulsive forces start to kick in, okay. So uh, there's a just a kind of a brief uh, qualitative description of the difference between uh, gravity and uh, electricity. Uh, let's look at the differences between electricity and magnetism. Now at this point, um, I'm going to kind of tell you, try to convince you that they're different. But it'll turn out towards the end of the section that magnetism really is electricity uh, in disguise. Okay, And uh, it was really Einstein who, um, uh, who really teased that one out very well with, uh, with his theory of special relativity. We won't go that far, but I'm going to give you all the experiments that led up to to that understand to Einstein's understanding. Okay, so electricity and magnetism, uh, they really are the same fundamental force. Okay, although on the surface, they don't seem to be. Okay. So uh, I mentioned that electrical substance comes in both positive and negative, okay? And you say, well, is there an equivalent for magnetic substance? And the answer is yes, it comes in north and south, north and south poles, okay? And uh, hopefully you've played with uh, with magnets as a kid. If not, well, uh, you know, go get a compass and a magnet and play with them. Uh, they're always a lot of fun. And uh, uh, the the north and south poles they act just like positive and negative in this sense. Uh, like poles will repel and opposite uh, poles will attract, okay? So basically, you know, uh, kind of similar to the diagram I had above, uh, but now I put a north pole of a magnet near the north pole of another magnet, they'll repel, okay? Or I put the south pole of a magnet near the south pole of another magnet, they'll also repel, okay? But if I put the north and the south together like that, then they're attractive, okay? And so you're starting to think, well, maybe, Maybe north is maybe just positive. Maybe we overnamed this. Maybe north, the north pole of a magnet is like positive and the south pole is uh, 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 is negative. Okay, north positive and south negative. Is that it? Is that what's going on here? And the answer is actually no. Uh, they are quite different. Okay, and uh, there's two experiments. There's probably more, but uh, just two experiments that I could uh, easily describe to you to prove to you that uh, north and south are not positive or negative. Okay, so uh, the first is if you just take north, uh, it's neither attracted nor repelled by a negative charge. Okay, so you could uh, have a north pole and you bring a negative charge or a positive charge near, and and it doesn't, it doesn't attract or repel it. And it's the same thing with with the south pole. The south pole is neither attracted nor repelled by um, uh, a, a charge. Okay, and so you could do this very simple experiment here. So you basically you take a magnet and you allow it to swivel through the middle. And by the way, as soon as you take a magnet and you allow it to swivel through the middle, middle, uh, you've got what's called a compass. Okay, because it'll point to uh, the North Pole here will point towards the North Pole of the Earth. Okay, and you bring a positive charge. You can move that positive charge, you know, near the North and near the South here like that. And the magnet goes, I don't care. I don't care. But if you were to take a, a magnet and put it near the North or the South here, boy, that that needle will will flip around pretty quickly. Okay, and so um, the you know the um, the positive charge this is, doesn't affect the compass at all. And you know, I pick positive, but you could do it with a negative and it would also make uh, no difference at all. Okay. And so yeah, it's uh, there, you know, this this experiment itself would be sufficient to show you that they are actually uh, not the same. Okay. Now, another experiment that you can do is you could try to separate north and south and try to separate positive and negative. And you'll discover something really interesting. Okay. Uh, you cannot separate north and south. All right. And you say, well, can't I just break a magnet in half? Yes, you can break a magnet in half. And here I've got a picture of a magnet north and south. And here you can see the squiggly line. I'm going to break that magnet in half. And you know what I get? Two magnets, both of them with a north-south pair. OK, so you can't separate a north-south pair. If there's a north somewhere nearby, there's a south. OK, so north and south always come paired together. OK, uh, now with uh, charges, yes, you can separate them. So, you know, like like here I have a positive and a negative. We could go right down to the microscopic level. So say this is a hydrogen atom, okay? So a hydrogen atom is made up of one proton and one electron. And can you ionize a hydrogen atom? That is, can you take that electron, which is orbiting this proton, just kick it out and leave the bare proton there and then the electron is flying off? The answer is yes, okay? So uh, uh, poles, 
cannot be separated, whereas uh, charges uh, can be separated, okay? And so, you know, it appears at this level, at least so far, that electricity and magnetism are different forces. But like I said later, uh, they will turn out to be uh, the same. Okay, uh, just one last thing I'm going to mention. It's not really part of the physics of this, but, uh, you know, just a, a, a kind of a curiosity about how uh, compasses work. So north is attracted to south, okay? That means that the north pole of a compass is attracted to the south pole of the earth, but it points north. And you know why? Because our geographical north like our North Pole, is actually a South Pole magnet, okay? So that's a little bit weird. You, you, wouldn't, uh, you may not have heard of that before. But yeah, North Pole, that is, you know, north of Canada, that's our geographical north. But it attracts the north of a compass. And so the north of a compass here is actually attracted towards the South Pole of the Earth, the South Magnetic Pole of the Earth, which is actually our geographical North Pole, okay? So uh, I won't say much more about that, but it's just kind of a curiosity. You might say, well, if North is attracted to South, then why does the North Pole of our compass point towards the North Pole of the Earth? Shouldn't it point towards the South Pole of the Earth? And the answer is it does. It's just that the geographical North uh, Pole is actually a magnetic South Pole. Okay, so a uh, little bit of a curiosity there. All right, let's go on. Now, um, electricity has been studied a lot, and you know uh, it's got a very interesting history, uh, uh, like how a lot of this stuff was discovered. I'm going to skip a lot of that detail um, just because we don't have time in this course. Uh, but one of the major players in that game was uh, Coulomb. Okay, uh, he was a French uh, uh, physicist, and uh, he basically was able to take uh, metal balls and create charges on them, put static charges on them. Static charges just means charges which are not moving, okay? So you'll hear me say of static electricity a lot, and you're wondering, why am I saying static electricity and not electricity? This is basically electricity which is not flowing, okay? Later on in the course, when we have electricity that flows, that'll be called a current, okay? So uh, anyhow, back, uh, back to Coulomb, he would have these balls, and he would look and put them together, and he was he was able to control how much charge you would have on them, okay? And uh, he would be able to bring them together and say, oh, look look at how much force is between them, okay? And so by knowing how much charge was on the balls and how close they were together in the forces uh, of repulsion or attraction, uh, he came up with Coulomb's Law. And here it is. Here's Coulomb's Law. So what does it say? The force between two charges, Q1 and Q2, so you have these two charges, Q1 and Q2, Okay, uh, and they're a distance R apart, and there's going to be a force, an electrical force between them, F, and that force is given by F is equal to K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. Okay, now what's K here? K is Coulomb's constant, okay? And, you know, like Q1 is going to be measured in some units called Coulombs. Q2 is going to be measured in Coulombs. Uh, M is going to be measured in meters. And what we want coming out of this is a force in Newtons. And so you got to have some number there that makes sure that all the units work out right. Okay. And this is known as Coulombs constant. There it is. K is equal to 8.99 times 10 to the 9 Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Okay. Now, uh, at this point, you might say, well, what the heck is a Coulomb? Well, you know, uh, in, in doing his work, uh, New, uh, Coulomb came up with uh, units of charge. And uh, the unit of charge today is called a Coulomb. OK, and uh, you'll see how many electrons that is in, a, in just a minute. But uh, basically, a Coulomb uh, turns out to be an extremely big unit for charge, okay? So, you know, if you're like walking across carpeting and you get a little bit of static electricity and you go to touch a doorknob and you feel that static electricity, you know, the little zap that you get with the door, uh, that's nowhere near a Coulomb. In fact, those kinds of charges are typically in the micro Coulomb range, okay? And remember that micro is 10 to the minus six. So we're talking millions of a Coulomb, all right? So those little sparks are, you know, in the millions of a Coulomb. Uh, for a, an entire Higher Coulomb, I mean, you're talking about lightning or something very serious like that. Okay, so uh, there we go. There's Coulomb slide. And, uh, you know, uh, let's do a simple example with it. Uh, we're not going to do a lot of problems with Coulomb's law because, uh, generally speaking, we're not that interested in you know just isolated charges. We're going to be more interested in charges that are that build up uh, certain configurations. 
uh, as you'll see. Okay, so um, uh, here we have an example where I have a 7 Coulomb charge, and it's placed 5 centimeters from a 3 Coulomb charge. Both of them are positive. And I ask two questions. Is the force attractive or repulsive? And how big is the force? Okay, well, the first thing is, and I put the pluses in front to, be, to, to emphasize this, uh, they're both positive charges. And positive and positive, they repel. Okay, so the force is repulsive. All right, and I wouldn't try to put signs inside of Coulomb's law or anything like that. Uh, what I would do is I would, uh, you know, just just by looking at the signs of the two charges, determine whether it's attractive or repulsive. Okay, so uh, over here, uh, how big is the force? In other words, what's its magnitude? So F is equal to K Q one Q two over R squared, and so here's Coulomb's law, and here is uh, the first charge, and it's seven microcoulombs, so that's seven times ten to the minus six. Coulombs, and then three times ten to the minus six coulombs divided by five centimeters. Convert that to meters. It's 0 0.05 meters. Crunch that through your calculator, and you get that it's 75 newtons. Okay, so 75 newtons. You know that's that's quite a bit of force. That's quite a bit of force between like a seven uh, microcoulomb charge and a five microcoulomb charge that are five centimeters apart. Okay, and so yeah, you know like. You, even a microcoulomb is big enough. It's it's big enough. That's that's a that's a, that's a substantial um, force there. Okay, so uh, let's go on here. Now, uh, how big? Like you want maybe an idea or a sense of like how big a coulomb is, and uh, the smallest unit of charge uh, in the universe is basically an electron. Okay, and well, there's some qualifications to that, but you know, like uh, electricity. Um, uh, for the purposes of this course, uh, electricity it comes in discrete bundles, and the smallest discrete bundle is basically an electron or a proton. And an electron has the same amount of charge as a proton. It's just that one is negative, the electron is negative, and the uh, proton is uh, is positive. Okay, and so uh, you know, like the uh, you either have a charge of zero or you have a charge of one electron or two electrons or three electrons, you're not going to have a charge of like uh, half an electron. Okay, that, that doesn't happen. All right. So, uh, you know, if you have something like uh, uh, plus seven microcoulombs, that represents a deficit of electrons in, in a material. Okay, it's like you've taken out some of the electrons. Okay, and so you can ask, naturally ask the question, how many electrons did you have to take out of this material in, in order to charge it to the point that it has a seven microcoulomb charge? By the way, uh, you might add, say to yourself, well, why are you taking the electrons out? Why not just add protons to the material? Because if you add protons to the material, you'll also, in, in, you know, make it positively charged. Okay, you can, so you can make it positively charged by adding protons or by removing electrons. And the answer is, um, the, the, the electrons are the, the fluffy things that flow, okay? Uh, so an atom uh, is made up of a nucleus, which is very, very heavy, and the electrons, which are on the outside, and they're very, very light, okay? Roughly speaking, an electron is only one two thousandth the mass of, uh, of a proton. It's actually one... one one hundred and one thousand and eighty one thousand eight hundred and something but just rounding it off it's like one two thousandth of uh, the mass of a proton so you could see that the the protons and the neutrons are very heavy and these electrons are fluff so they're the ones that actually tend to do the flowing they're the things that get removed from material or added to a material to charge it up okay so um it turns out that uh the charge of one electron is minus 1.6 times 10 to the 19, 9, minus 19 coulombs. Okay, uh, that was actually measured by uh, Millikan uh, a little over 100 years ago. Okay, so one electron, it's negatively charged, so you can see the negative sign there, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Okay, and so the number of electrons you're going to have is basically the full charge, which is that seven microcoulombs or seven times 10 to the minus six divided by the charge of just one electron, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And that turns out to be 4.38 times 10 to the 13 electrons. Okay. Now that looks like a big number, but it's actually not a big number at all. Okay. So that's the number of electrons that you would actually have to remove from material to charge it up to seven microcoulombs, but it's not a lot of uh, electrons and you go well 10 to the 13 that sounds like a lot to me okay uh, and uh, no because most macroscopic materials are made up of approximately a mole of matter 
okay, roughly speaking. In other words, like if you, you know, if you have some object in your hand and you say, how many particles are in this object? Well, you know, you don't know exactly, but you know the order of magnitude. It's going to be roughly 10 to the 23. If it's a small object, maybe 10 to the 22 particles. If it's a big object, maybe 10 to the 24, but roughly in the 10 to the 23 particle region okay and uh, I'm thinking of Avogadro's number here 6 times 10 to the 23 okay so so macroscopic objects are about 10 to the 23 but this is down at 10 to the 13 okay and that's 10 orders of magnitude difference okay that's like that's like one ten billionth of a mole all right and so all you're basically doing to get that seven uh, microcoulomb charge is taking out one electron out of every 10 billion atoms okay and so uh, it doesn't take a lot to create a, a significant charge and this gives you a sense of just how strong uh, electricity is okay uh, most matter is very close to being charge neutral in other words count the number of protons count the number of electrons uh, they're equal okay and that gives you charge neutrality if you were to pull out even one electron out of every 10 billion atoms, then you've got a seven microcoulomb charge. And that's enough that if you put it beside that, like in the previous example, that three microcoulomb charge, at even a five centimeter distance, you've got 75 newtons of, uh, of force, okay? So electricity is pretty darn strong. It's a, it's a strong force, okay? Uh, air, all right, and uh, one more thing to, to note before we go on to the next subject. Um, if you were looking carefully here, uh, you would have noticed that Coulomb's law looks a lot like another law that we've seen earlier last semester. And you can actually co uh, compare uh, Coulomb's law to Newton's universal gravitational law. Okay. And so here I have them both side by side. Oh, I lost this. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Here I have them both side by side. Okay. So uh, here's Coulomb's law, F is equal to K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. And here's Newton's universal gravitational law. So remember, uh, between any two masses in the universe, M1 and M2, there's going to be a force of gravity given by F is equal to G, M1, M2 over R squared. Okay, They look very similar, uh, except that where you have masses with uh, Newton's universal gravitational law, you have charges with Coulomb, understandably so, because masses cause gravity, whereas charges cause electricity, okay? They're both inverse R squared laws, okay? And we actually saw that with intensity with sound, okay? A lot of things follow this inverse R squared law, all right? And there we go, all right? And they both have a constant, but of course the constants are different because we're we're trying to match different units here. This is G, and if you remember from last semester, that's the universal gravitational law, uh, gravitational constant. And this is K, which is Coulomb's constant, okay? And you can actually compare the sizes of the two, and you can see that Coulomb's constant is 8.99 times 10 to the plus nine Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared, whereas, Newton's universal gravitational constant is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Okay. Now, this one, Coulomb's constant, is much bigger than uh, Newton's gravitational constant uh, by many orders of magnitude. Okay. Like this is plus nine and that's negative 11. Okay. So this is a very tiny number and that's a very big number. All right. Uh, it is a bit of uh, comparing apples and oranges because like how big is a Coulomb versus how big is a uh, is a kilogram and a kilogram, you know, a kilogram of stuff is is approximately the, um, you know, the amount of stuff that you have like at the macroscopic level, whereas a Coulomb is pretty big. OK, it's probably a million times bigger than, uh, you know, ordinary uh charges that you have at the macroscopic level but nonetheless you know you've got this huge difference in orders of magnitude and that's because again the electrical force is much larger than the uh, uh, than the gravitational force okay all right next topic okay electric field all right so uh, let me give you the definition of an electric field first and then try to tell you why it's kind of an interesting idea basically an electric field is defined as the force at some point in space divided by uh, 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 the, the amount of charge at that point in space so it's basically the amount of force you get per unit charge okay now why is this an interesting idea uh, and uh, um, 
to do to motivate that, uh, I'm actually going to compare it uh, to gravity, uh, gravitational uh, field, which is G. And here for the electric field, okay, uh, you can write this equation right here. All right. So the amount of force that you get at a particular point in space, so you pick a point in space, okay, you pick a point in space and you say, what's the electrical field there? E. And you say, okay, I'm going to put a charge Q at that point in space, Q. And if you multiply Q times E together, you get the amount of force that that electric field is exerting on that charge Q. Okay. Uh, so F is equal to QE is a formula that we'll be using to relate the force on a charged particle in an electric field E. And this formula here should look kind of familiar because you can draw a direct analogy to masses in a gravitational field. So if you've got a mass M, okay, right here, you've got this mass M, and you put it in a gravitational field that is G, little g, 9.8 meters per second squared, well, then there's a force on it, okay? And you could say the force of a, a, a the force on a mass M in a gravitational field G is equal to F is equal to MG. Okay, and so let me try to put both of these together. Okay, so here you've got uh, from last semester F is equal to MG. All right, so a mass M in a gravitational field G gives you a force F. Here, the analogous idea is a charge Q in an electric field E gives you a force F. Okay, so um, the way you can think about this is uh, uh, you know here here's the gravitational example so everywhere in space there's this gravitational field you can't see it and you go well how do I know it's there the only way you're going to know it's there is if you put a mass m at a particular point in space every point in space has like a little vector attached to it g this vector has a magnitude of 9.8 meters per second uh, squared and it always points down every point in space has this point this vector g pointing down okay i'd be really weird if there were this pocket of space which didn't have any gravitational field in it because if you put a, a mass into that point it would experience no no gravitational force because no gravitational field no gravitational force but everywhere at the surface of the earth you could say at every single point here it's like this point here has a vector g and it points down and its magnitude is 9.8 meters per second squared okay so you don't see the field but if you put a mass m in there, so here I'm going to put this mass m in my gravitational field, da -da, that mass m experiences a force F due to that gravitational field. Okay, so that's the gravity way of thinking about it. For electricity, you can do the same thing. But now what you need to do is, whoops, let me just scroll down a bit here. What you do is you basically create these two parallel plates here and you charge them. Okay, so you could do this with metal plates. So here you could think of this as a metal plate and here's a metal plate here like that. And uh, using a battery or, or whatever technique you like, uh, you're going to pull electrons out of the top plate, making it positively charged. And you're going to add electrons to the bottom plate, making it negatively charged. Okay, and then in this region between these two plates, you've essentially established an electric field. And you go, well, how do I know there's an electric field there? Well, just like in the gravitational field, you find out that there's something, that there's a field there by putting a mass, in the, in the case of the gravitational field, for electricity, you put a charge. And so here I am, I'm going to put this charge Q in the middle of my electric field. It's called a test charge because that's exactly what you're using it for. You're testing for the presence of an electric field. So you put this positive charge in here and you say to it, well, what force is on it? Well, let's think about this for a minute. Okay, so you've got all these positive charges up here and they are repelling the positive charge. Okay, so the positive charge here is being repelled by all of these positive charges up here. And the negative charges down here, they're all attracting the positive charge. And so the positive charge feels repulsion from above and attraction from below and you've got all these different vectors here okay and there's some vectors which are to the right have a little bit of a right component component to the right there's some vectors which have a little bit of a component to the left but because of the symmetry if you were to break this down uh, each of these vectors into a, a, a vertical component and a horizontal component all of the horizontal components would cancel out. And that's because there's as many components to the left as there are components to the right. And all your right components will cancel all your left components. And basically there would be no horizontal force on this charged particle, okay? However, 
all of these vectors have a downwards component to them. Okay, none of them have an upwards component. It's being repelled by the top plate and attracted to the bottom plate. And essentially what that means is that you get a force on this charged particle, which is downwards. Okay, so here's that charged particle Q positive, and there's going to be a force downwards away from the positive plate and towards the negative plate, purely downwards. And if you move this chest charge everywhere in between these two parallel plates, you would find that at every point in space, the electric field is pointing down away from the positive towards the, the negative. Okay, and so you've got that only on the edges does the, the electric field kind of fray out, okay? So I did draw the, you know, the electric field kind of like bulging out at the edges here like that. But everywhere in the middle of these uh, parallel plates, uh, the, the horizontal components of the forces are all gonna cancel and the symmetry is gonna insist that the, electric, that the electric force be purely down. As you can see here, my F is purely down, okay? And that means that uh, the electric field is purely down. And the other thing is, now I'm not gonna do a full analysis of this. Uh, it actually requires uh, vector calculus to do it. But if you were to do a proper analysis of this, you would find that not only is the electric field always pointing down in this region of space, that is the region between the two parallel plates, it's always constant. So the electric field is a constant downwards value all the way through here okay and uh, you know again I can't really prove that very easily not even for physics 102 uh, but it does turn out to be that so in a sense these parallel plates is exactly the electrical equivalent to a uh, gravitational field at the surface of the earth because a gravitational field at the surface of the earth is a constant gravitational pull down of uh, 9.8 meters per second squared. And the electric field between these two plates is a constant E. Now E might be different depending on the plates, but it's a constant value of E, it's a constant magnitude of E, always pointing from the positive to the negative plate. Okay, so I think you can see the analogy between gravity at the surface of the earth and the electric field between uh, two parallel plates. So electric fields are, are very useful this way. They're very useful in terms of picturing what would happen if you put a charged particle at a particular point in, in that space. Okay. And uh, um, uh, I don't want you to think that the electric field is going to be always up and down the way the gravitational field is. Uh, in my previous diagrams, I did it that way to try to you know, hammer home the analogy between gravity, which is downwards, and the electric field. Uh, but uh, no, the electric field is always from basically the positive plate to the to the negative plate, no matter what the orientation is. Okay, so uh, they are they are different forces, and uh, and there it is. Okay, so electric field, if if the plates were uh, uh, oriented vertically this way, and you've got positive on this side and negative there, you would have an electric field pointing from the positive plate uh, to the negative plate. Okay, so uh, before we do a problem, uh, let's ask the question, what are the units of the electric field? And if you rearrange the force F is equal to QE to, to E is equal to F over Q, uh, the units of force are newtons and the units of charge are coulombs. And so the electric field has units of newtons per coulomb. Okay, uh, basically it's telling you how many newtons a force do you get for every coulomb of charge that you put at a particular point in space? So I, I pick this point, I put, I don't know, three coulombs there. How many uh, newtons of force do I get? Say three newtons of force. So if I got three newtons of force on three coulombs, that's gonna be one newton per coulomb of uh, force for every, uh, for, for the charge that I put at that point in space, okay? All right, so let's do a problem. And uh, this problem was actually inspired by what's known as the Millikan oil drop experiment. And that was the experiment that Millikan did many uh, years ago, about 100 years ago, um, to actually determine how big a, the charge of an electron was, what, what the charge of an electron was. Okay, and so here, um, you know, during a thunderstorm, the electric field between the Earth and the clouds is found to be 100 newtons per coulomb. Okay, and uh, this is sufficient to keep a drop of water with a mass of 0.1 grams from falling. So here's this drop of water, and of course gravity wants to pull it down, but the electric field is pushing it up, and it doesn't want to fall. It's not going to fall. It keep, the electric field keeps it from falling, and the droplet 
just remain suspended. In fact, if the electric field were stronger, then the droplet would go up, okay? But no, the electric field is just strong enough to keep that droplet uh, suspended in space, okay? And I want to know what's the charge on the drop, okay? So let's calculate that, okay? Now, uh, we don't know, I didn't tell you in the problem whether the electric field was pointing up or down. I didn't say if the ground was positively charged or the clouds are positively charged. So, um, you know, we won't uh, uh, we won't worry about that, but we can calculate the charge, okay? And uh, basically, what you have to have in this situation is the force of gravity up has to be exactly balanced by the sorry the the, the electrical force up has to be exactly balanced by the uh, force of gravity down, okay? And since the for, since the droplet is uh, suspended, these two have to be equal to one another, okay? So the the electrical force that's equal to QE, and the gravitational force that's equal to mg. We're solving for Q, so we could just rewrite this as Q is equal to mg over E, like that. And uh, plugging in the numbers, uh, the, uh, the mass here, the mass of the uh, droplet was 0.1 grams, but we have to convert to kilograms, so it's 0.1 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms. G, I'm just going to round off to 10 meters per second squared. And E, I told you in the problem that it's 100 newtons per coulomb. All of these units are in MKS, and so this works out to 1 times 10 to the minus 5 coulombs, okay? So uh, this is a small charge, all right? Uh, but um, uh, let's convert it to actually a uh, number of electrons just to give an idea of like how many electrons you would have to either add or remove from the droplet in order to get uh, um, the, um, the charge, sufficient charge so that it remains suspended. Uh, in this electric field, okay? And so the number of electrons is going to be equal to the total charge divided by the charge of one electron, and there's the charge of one electron, okay? So one electron has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 uh, coulombs. If you divide that, you're going to get this number here, 0 0.625 times 10 to the uh, 14 uh, um, electrons okay so uh, again this is either a deficit or a surplus I'm not sure which because I didn't tell you but uh, um, there it is okay now that's actually quite a lot of electrons and I wonder if such a droplet is even possible because uh, with that many electrons on a tiny little droplet it might be enough to actually you know tear the droplet apart okay so I don't know but uh, you know that that is the, the correct answer there okay so um, that's one problem. Here's another problem with electric fields. Uh, uh, what's the acceleration of an electron in a 10,000 uh, Newton per Coulomb field? Okay, and so if you put an electron inside of an electric field and you let go, that electron is going to start to accelerate. It's going to accelerate away from the negative plate and it's going to accelerate towards the positive plate. And I might want to know how much is this electron going to be accelerating. Okay, so uh, well, let's figure out the force on the electron first because the force is equal to QE and Q, the charge of an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. I'm not worried about the sign here. Yes, I know it is a negative uh, 1.6, but uh, I'm only worried about the magnitude of the force. Okay, so I'm not worried about the direction. I know it's going to be away from the negative plate towards the positive plate. So if you're wondering why did I drop the negative sign, that's why. Okay, and so I got 1.6 times 10 to the 19 coulombs, and the electric field is 10,000 uh, newtons per coulomb, or 10 to the 4 newtons per coulomb, and that gives me a force of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 15 uh, newtons. Okay, that is a very tiny force but electrons are very tiny, okay? So the charge of an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. What's the mass, all right? And I did tell you that they are very, very light. So here we go. So now that we have the force and uh, we're gonna look up the mass, we can calculate the acceleration. So the acceleration is just the force divided by the mass. And it turns out that the mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, okay? So if you remember the mass of a proton was like 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27, and this is minus 31. So we're talking between minus 27 and minus 31, that's uh, uh, four orders of magnitude, okay? So that is significantly, a significant, uh, uh, electrons are significantly smaller than, than protons, okay? So if we plug that in here, we get that the, uh, oops, I made a mistake. Sorry, guys, that should be A there. So you see where I have F there? That should be an A, okay? Uh, so A is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 15 divided by the mass. 
and you get that the uh, acceleration on the electron is 1.76 times 10 to the 15 meters per second squared. Okay, so again, I apologize that F there, right there, that should be an A because A is meters per second squared. So the acceleration is 1.76 times 10 to the 15 meters per second squared. And I put a wow beside there because the acceleration due to gravity is 10 meters per second squared. That's like 10 to the 1. And this is like 10 to the 15. So this is huge. And by the way, it's not at all hard in the lab to produce uh, 10,000 uh, uh, newtons per coulomb electric field. Okay. In fact, uh, in my example later, you'll see how to do that with the battery. All right, so there we go. There's the story with electric fields. Basically, um, just to summarize, there's a series of charges that create an electric field. That would be like the the the, the charges on the plates, okay? And uh, all the space um, around those charges and between those charges has an electric field. If you put a test charge inside of that electric field, it's going to have a force, and the force on that charge is going to equal to Q times E, where E is the electric field. So F is equal to QE. All right. And it's very much analogous, electric field is very much analogous to G uh, in uh, uh, gravity. All right, so the next topic is going to be electrical potential energy and electrical potential. Now, these two are sometimes confused because the names are very similar, but the first is electrical potential energy, and the second one is electrical potential, okay, or voltage. All right, so. Um, the um, electrical potential energy is basically the equivalent of um, gravitational potential energy, okay? But the uh, electrical potential uh, 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 energy is due to the charges, uh, configuration of the charges, whereas gravitational potential energy is due to the uh, configuration of the masses, okay? Uh, now, electrical potential, which is also called voltage, it's not really the potential energy, it's the potential energy per unit charge that you place at a particular point in space, okay? And so uh, so voltage is going to be the potential energy divided by the charge. All right, so let's see how that works. And again, uh, to get the idea straight in our head, um, we're actually going to do uh, gravity and, and uh, compare it to, to electricity. So with gravity, you know, near the surface of the Earth, you have this uh, gravitational field here like that. Okay, and it's uniform gravitational field, and you have a mass m, and it's at some height h like that. Okay, so the um, the gravitational um, potential energy of this, I'm going to give it the symbol u uh, here. I, I think last semester I just called it pe, but I'm going to give it u, and it's going to be a subscript g because this is the gravitational potential energy. It's equal to the mass. The bigger the mass, the more gravitational potential energy you get. It's equal to the size of the field g and it's equal to h that is how far into the field the mass has been moved okay so this idea of like moving into a field and gaining energy as you move into a field that's a little bit different than the way we thought about it last, last semester but we should start thinking about it now you can think about the mass at the ground here if the mass is at the ground it's got no potential energy as i lift the mass what am i doing i'm moving it into the field i'm moving it into the field if i move it into the field h a distance h, then the uh, gravitational potential energy is equal to mgh like that. Okay, so great. So there's the um, uh, the story with gravity. What about electricity? Well, the equivalent of a uniform gravitational field in, in electricity is the parallel plate. So here we go. We've got a positive plate on top and a negative plate on the bottom. Again, the orientation, I just put them this way so that the analogy is obvious, but you know, it doesn't matter what the orientation of the plates are. Okay. And so inside uh, between these two plates, there is a uniform electric field. Okay. And it's always pointing from the positive towards the negative like that. All right. And the charge here has a charge Q. All right, and I've moved it, I've displaced it into the field a distance h. Now think about this, this is a charge q, and so this charge q, where would it like to sit? It would like to sit right here on the negative plate because it's being repelled away from the positive plates and being attracted to uh, the negative plates, okay? So, uh, you know, at the, if I were to just sort of place that positive charge right here on the negative plate, it would say, I'm happy here leave me alone, you know, I'm fine. Now, if I take it and I lift it, it wants to fall back down. If I take it and I lift it a distance h into the, um, into the field, 
okay? Then uh, as I'm lifting it into the field, as I'm pulling this charge Q into the field, then I'm giving it potential energy. And if I've pulled it into the field at distance H, then the potential energy that this uh, charge has is equal to QEH, okay? And so, uh, you know, a charge Q, the bigger the charge Q, the more potential energy it has. The bigger the field, the more potential energy it has. And the more I've pulled this charge H into the uh, uh, field, the, the bigger the potential energy is. Okay. Now, uh, uh, I've been working a lot with positive charges, and uh, that's kind of traditional in this field uh, to just work with positive charges. But let's think about what would happen with a negative charge. Okay. Let's keep the positive plate on top and the negative plate on the bottom. For negative charges, and I've got a problem for this later. Okay. For negative charges, it's kind of like this whole picture gets flipped upside down. So if a negative charge were in here, it would actually want to sit up here at the positive plate. Okay. And then uh, with a negative charge, uh, as you pull it into the field, it would gain potential energy. And if you let go, it would want to fall back up that way that way okay and so um, over here this potential energy uh, it's being measured to the negative plate because that's where the positive charge wants to go the positive charge wants to go to the negative plate but if I had a negative charge in there then that H would actually be measured towards the positive plate because it wants to fall to the towards the, the positive plate okay there was no equivalent of that with gravity because gravity is purely attractive and so there was only one way down but over here if I put a charge in here if it's a positive charge it falls down that is, it's attracted to the negative plate. But if I put a negative charge in there, it's, it's flipped. Uh, it, it gets actually attracted towards the positive plate and it falls up. Okay, so just keep that in mind because um, in a lot of my examples, as I'm presenting the theory, I'm going to be thinking about putting a positive charge in there. But in general, uh, you know, like we could be doing this also with uh, negative charges. And uh, just to, to, to uh, you know, um, make the... Uh, similarity explicit here, uh, the gravitational potential energy and the um, uh, electrical potential energy, they're quite synonymous. Uh, if you take mass and replace it with Q, you go from gravity to uh, electricity. If you take G, which remember was the measure of the gravitational field, okay, at the surface of the Earth, G, and you replace it with E, then you know, again, you're going from gravitational potential energy to uh, electrical potential energy and it's h in both of them okay it's the uh it's h because it's the distance in which you've pulled the uh, the object into the uh, into the field okay now everything i talked about up to this point was electrical potential energy let me now define for you electrical potential okay so electrical potential is given the symbol v and it's equal to the potential energy per unit charge. Okay, so it's like the potential energy divided by Q. Okay, now this is a general definition and it's used everywhere. But, uh, you know, like unless you want to start pulling out vector calculus, the easiest place where you can actually apply this is to the parallel plates because everything in the parallel plates is simple because the electric field is uh, a constant. Uh, just like, just like uh, you know, with gravity, G, the acceleration due to gravity is a constant. Okay, so uh, for the parallel plates, this formula here, V is equal to, uh, uh, this formula here, sorry, reduces to V is equal to QEH divided by Q, the Q's cancel, and you just get that V is equal to E times H. Okay, and so uh, basically what this formula here is saying is that uh, the further you go into the electric field, the more you the more you go into the electric field, the more voltage you have. Or another way to think about it is the voltage is going to be equal to how big your electric field is multiplied by how far you've moved into it. Okay. Uh, I just put this in summary here because, you know, uh, we actually are going to use these equations quite a bit. So I thought I'd just summarize them and put a little box around them. But basically, you know, uh, if you have an electric field, and you multiply by how far you went into it, that's going to give you your voltage. And if you have your voltage and you multiply it by the charge that you put at that point, that's going to give you your um, potential energy. Okay. So um, what are the units of V? Okay. So the units of V using this formula right here. So if we take this formula here, which is basically the definition of V. All right. And we... Um, 
uh, substitute in the units, you've got V is going to equal the units of energy divided by the units of Q. That's equal to joules per coulomb. Okay, and a joule per coulomb is by definition a volt. All right, so there you go. So you know volts like you know like a 12 volt battery or 1.5 volt battery, uh, or or uh, electrical output is 120 volts. Okay, what that's telling you is that for every coulomb that flows out of that battery or that flows through that socket, uh, it's being given so many joules. So like with a 12 volt battery, for every coulomb that flows out of that battery, it's delivered. 12 uh, joules of energy okay so there you go there's a 12 volt battery or a 9 volt battery again it would be 9 9 joules for every coulomb that flow out of the battery all right so it's not exactly an energy it's an energy per unit charge uh, that either flows out of the battery or that is at a particular point in space now the next thing is um, the electric field now has come up in two formulas one formula for the electric field was f is equal to qe okay which gave us the electric field as newtons per coulomb okay and we can actually see it right here okay newtons per coulomb but now we've also seen an electric field in a different context you've seen an electric field in terms of its potential okay potential voltage they mean the same thing so you'll hear me use both of those words okay uh, so if you've got uh, uh, an electric field and you travel a certain distance into it then you know you've gained so much voltage and so an electric field can be written as volts divided by H and volts, voltage is measured in volts and distance is measured in, um, in meters. And so another way to think of an electric field is that it's so many volts per meter. Okay, so uh, you can either think of electric field as uh, so many newtons per coulomb if you put a charge at a particular point in space or it is so many volts per meter. Okay, for how far you've actually displace the charged particle into an electric field. All right. So uh, now we can do a, uh, a problem. All right. So uh, what is the voltage at various points between two charged plates? OK, and suppose the plates are charged such that there is a, a thousand volt potential difference between them. OK, so uh, here's what I'm asking. I've basically got these uh, two electric plates here. So this one is positively charged and that one is negatively charged. Okay. Now, how did I charge them up such that there was a 1000 volt difference in there? Well, basically you can do that by just attaching them to a battery. This symbol here, which you should see in the lab or will see in the lab, uh, is basically a series of alternating long and short uh, lines like that. This is basically the symbol for a battery. Okay. And this particular battery is a thousand volts. When I attach that battery, to these parallel plates here, these metal plates, what the battery is going to do is it's going to suck electrons out of the positive plate and it's going to move them over to the negative plate. OK, now it's going to continue doing that, but it can't do that forever because it gets harder and harder to pull uh, positive uh, to electrons out of the positive and deposit them into the negative. Think about it. An electron would want to be where the positives are. OK, and so the act of pulling an electron away from those positives and then putting them where the electron doesn't want to go, which is in this negative plate, that's going to take energy. OK, and so, uh, you know, the energy in displacing these that's being delivered by this battery. Now, this continues until there's a potential difference between the two plates of a thousand volts okay and now what I want you to do is I want you to tell me what's the um, potential at various points in there and so let's just scroll down here like that and so here's my question what is the so this is a that's like point a right there what is the voltage in the middle of the two plates okay so what's the voltage right in the middle of these two plates all right and then I also have a question what is the voltage two centimeters from the negative plate so there we are I'm just trying to indicate here you know that point B is um, uh, two centimeters away from the uh, uh, from the uh, negative plate and then I didn't put C here but you know I, I could ask the same question like what is the voltage two centimeters away from the, uh, the positive plate or I, I you know I can ask what's the voltage at any point between these two plates okay so how do you answer that well, the first thing is uh, between those two parallel plates, there is a uh, an electric field. OK, so the electric field is um, uh, equal to V divided by H. OK, and that's from above. And so um, it's a thousand volts. 
in there divided by 0.1 meters and if you take a thousand volts divided by 0.1 meters you get an electric field of 10,000 volts per meter by the way that's the exact same electric field that I had for that electron that was experiencing that acceleration at about uh, 10 to the 15 uh, meters per second squared okay so there's 10,000 volts per meter and so this is not hard to produce a 10,000 volt per meter um, uh, electric field all you need is a thousand volts this is easy to do in a lab with a uh, 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 power source okay and you know you just put the two the the two parallel plates um, uh, 10 centimeters apart and you've got a 10,000 volt per uh, meter electric field okay now again uh, if you look above I, I did have 10,000 the magnitude of the electric field was 10,000, but there I had the units as newtons per coulomb, but don't forget that a newton per coulomb is exactly the same as a volt per meter, okay? They're both uh, uh, totally legitimate units for uh, electric field, okay? Now, that's the electric field in here, and it's a constant throughout here. It's always uh, um, 10,000 um, volts per meter, okay? And now the question was, uh, you know what is the uh, what is the uh, voltage at various points? Well, actually, to answer that and to make it more intuitive, rather than doing it in MKS units, I decided, you know what, what's the electric field, but in per centimeters? And so another, um, uh, not another way, but uh, you know, using centimeters, E is going to be a uh, thousand volts for. 10 centimeters and so that's 100 volts per centimeter and so the way to think about this is over here you know the distance in here is 10 centimeters as you move from the positive plate to the negative plate okay or actually from the negative plate to the positive plate so if you're a positive charge you want to sit here if you want to sit here you basically have uh, no energy and for every centimeter that you move towards the positive plate you're gaining a thousand volts. Okay, I'm sorry, a hundred volts. And so one centimeter in, a hundred volts. Two centimeter in, 200 volts. Three centimeters in, 300 volts. Four centimeters in, 400 volts. Five centimeters in, 500 volts, and so on, all the way until you get to a uh, thousand volts. Okay, and so now it becomes pretty easy to answer the question because if you're halfway between the two plates, well, oops, let me stroll down a little bit more if you're halfway between the two plates okay then you're at 500 volts okay and if you're two centimeters away from the negative plate then you're at 200 volts okay because you'd be at zero volts there always think in terms of a positive charge a positive charge would want to sit right there okay that's where this positive charge would want to be and so over here it's like you've pulled it into the field 200 volts okay if you pull it to the halfway point that's going to be 500 volts if you pull it all the way so that it's two centimeters from the positive plate then it's eight centimeters from the negative plate and you're at 800 volts if you pull it all the way to the um to the positive plate then you've gone the full um thousand volts okay so now um you can see that that uh, the the way this uh, um, this is working is that the um, voltage basically grows linearly as you move from the uh, negative plate to the positive plate, and the electric field is basically a constant pointing from the positive plate to the negative plate, and it's a constant. It, it shows the, the direction in which the voltage decreases. It decreases a thousand volts for every centimeters. So a hundred volts for every centimeters that you uh, travel from the positive to the negative plate. Okay, so um, this actually leads to a very nice analogy, and you've actually heard me talk about uh, the potential as potential difference or a potential drop. You'll hear you'll hear people talking about this as a potential drop, and the reason is is that you can actually think of uh, potential as kind of like a like a height. Okay, and uh, the positive um, uh, a positive charge would want to go from a high point from from high up to low. Okay, and so the potential is kind of like how high the positive charge is above the low plate, and the electric field is kind of like the slope of the hill. Okay, so let's look at this picture here and see if, how that analogy works out. So over here, if you have a positive charge here, that's like it's up high on the hill and it wants to roll all the way down here to the negative okay so if it's only halfway up the hill then it's only half at half the maximum voltage you know if it's up at uh, uh, 80 percent of the height then it's you know 80 percent of the the full voltage which is 800 volts and if it's over here it's not that high off the uh, above the negative plate and so it's only at 200 volts and 
E is kind of like the slope. It's kind of like saying, well, how much do you drop for every centimeter of distance that you travel from one to the other? OK, and this is saying that you drop 100 volts for every centimeter. OK, and so people tend to think about voltage as kind of like uh, the electrical equivalent of height. And they tend to think about the electric field as kind of like the electrical equivalent of a slope. OK, if you were to bring these two plates closer together, say they were only one centimeter apart, but they're still charged up to a thousand volts. Well, then you would have not a drop of 100 volts per centimeter, but you would have a drop of a thousand volts per centimeter. OK, so here's a thousand volts between these two plates and they're only a centimeter apart. So now you'd be dropping a thousand volts between them. So now it's much steeper. The, st uh, the electric field would be a thousand volts per centimeter. It's a much steeper drop. Okay, so I don't know if that helps or not, but this is basically the way people tend to think about uh, potential and electric fields. They're very much uh, related to one another. And uh, I don't know if you've ever studied cartography, but in cartography, they often draw maps with the heights. They're kind of like these circular lines that show equal heights. Okay, and uh, there's an equivalent of that in uh, electricity where you can draw lines of equal potential. Okay, and these equal potential lines kind of, you know, um, show the height and whenever the equal potential lines are close to one another that's where the the the, the hill is steepest okay all right so uh, i don't want to go too far into that analogy you know i hope it helps a little bit to give you a, an intuitive sense into what electric field and potential are okay so uh let's do a uh, problem because we can do a problem now with uh, this information we have these two plates they're 10 centimeters apart and we charge them to a thousand volts okay and we place an electron set seven centimeters from the positive plate and release it from rest okay so we have this electron we place it into the um into the uh, uh, electric field and uh, we um, uh, release it from rest. Okay. And it's seven centimeters from the positive plate. Now I purposely picked a negative charge because we've been working with positive charges a lot. So now I want to think in terms of the negative charge. Uh, if this were a positive charge, it'd want to go to the uh, negative plate. But no, this is a negative charge. So things are flipped. Uh, it wants to go away from the negative plate here and it wants to go towards the positive plate. So uh, what you want to think about is how far is the electric charge from the positive plate and it's seven centimeters, okay? Not to be tricky, but if I said, you know, the charge is three centimeters from the, uh, uh, from the negative plate, you wouldn't be using that in your problems. You wouldn't be using H is equal to three. You'd actually be using H is equal to seven. You want to think, where does this negative charge want to go? This negative charge wants to go to the positive plate. How far is it traveling? Seven centimeters. OK, so uh, that's important. Uh, you know, like I, I could give you protons or I can give you electrons on a test or on an, in the assignments. I think I have protons. And so when you've got the protons, they're positively charged. This entire diagram is flipped. OK, so the protons would want to go with the electric field. The electrons want to go against the electric field. OK, you can think of them as falling uphill. OK, because they're like they're negatives. OK. All right. So um, the question now is from there to there, what's the potential difference? OK, so you've got the electron there and it's going to go to the positive plate. What's the uh, what's the potential difference? Well, from above, the potential difference V is equal to EH. OK, so you've got the electric field times the distance. Now, we don't want to go all the way across because the electron isn't traveling the full distance. The electron is only going to travel seven centimeters. And so the electric field, we just found that uh, it's a uh, 100 volts for every centimeter and it's going to travel seven centimeters. So the potential difference for this that this electron is going to experience is 700 volts. OK, so yeah, I know that this is zero there and it's a uh, uh, thousand there. But over here, you could think of that as being like three centimeters from there. So this is like at 300. So if I were to draw like I could have drawn here 300 uh, volts and it's going to go from 300 volts to the thousand volts, that's a difference of 700 volts. OK, so now um, we I asked for uh, the velocity. OK, so I'm going to be releasing this electron from here. And I said, how fast does the electron slam into the positive plate? And whoops, uh, scroll down here. OK, uh, for the for the um, 
the, the speed, we want to get the energies because uh, we'll actually be able to get the kinetic energy and from the kinetic energy, you can get the uh, velocity. So uh, the potential energy associated with that potential difference is given by this formula. U is equal to Q times V. Okay. And so um, we have that Q this is a charge of one electron is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Again, I'm not worried about the, the negative sign because the negative sign is really all about the direction and we've already taken care of the direction. We've analyzed that already. So it's just going to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And the voltage here, the potential difference between where the electron starts and where it ends is 700 volts. But notice that I wrote it as joules per coulomb. And you can see here, because that's the definition of a volt is joules per coulomb, you can see here that the coulombs would uh, will cancel. And you're going to find that this is going to give you 1.12 times 10 to the minus 16 joules. Okay, so that's the potential energy of the electron when it's sitting right here. Okay, so when the electron is sitting right there, all the energy is potential. And I even said in the problem that I release it from rest. Okay, so I'm not giving the electron any kind of a kick, any kind of an initial velocity, because that would be extra energy on top of the potential energy. No, I'm releasing it from rest. So at this point, all the energy is potential. It's all potential energy. Okay, and we found that that, that is equal to, it's equal to this 1.12 times 10 to the minus 16. Now, What's going to happen is when you release that electron, it's going to speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up. It's going to be losing potential energy and it's going to be gaining kinetic energy. Once again, that hill analogy that I gave you earlier, uh, you know, where you think of that 700 volts is kind of like a drop. Uh, think of this as like a roller coaster. OK, and uh, this uh, electron is going downhill 700 volts. OK, and so it's dropping 700 volts from there to there. Well, at the top of the hill, it uh, it had all potential energy, and then when it gets to the bottom, all that potential energy is going to be converted to kinetic energy. Okay, and so the kinetic energy is going to equal the potential energy. Okay, so all of that energy is going to be converted to kinetic, and kinetic is calculated with one half mv squared, like that. And so the the uh, potential energy we worked that out already. It's one point one two times ten to the minus sixteen. Okay. Uh, joules and that's going to equal one half and now you need the mass of the electron okay which i gave you above it's 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms and we've got v squared here okay so uh just working out v squared okay it's just a little bit of a uh, arithmetic in there you find that v is equal to 1.57 times 10 to the 7 meters per second okay now uh you know Never in a physics problem, never just come up with a number and, uh, you know, just write it down. Think about, does it make sense? And it's kind of hard to, to recognize whether this makes sense or not, because this is huge. This is a big number. OK, uh, why is it a big number? Well, because an electron is very, very light. OK, and so the only thing we can really compare that speed to is the speed of light the fastest known speed in the universe. Nothing travels faster than the speed of light in a vacuum. So the speed of light in a vacuum is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. All right. And um, this is uh, 1.57 times 10 to the seven meters per second. So roughly speaking, okay, this electron is traveling at 5% the speed of light. All right. And so that is very, very fast. And you might wonder, well, is that possible? Can you really get to like 5% or some fraction of the speed of light uh, in the lab? And the answer is yes, you can. Okay. Now, one thing I didn't mention is if you were to do this as an experiment, you might wonder how in the world can I do this? Well, yeah, you can do it this way. OK, uh, you could uh, have these plates and you can charge them up using a thousand volts. Easy to do. Uh, with a power supply in a lab, a thousand volts is not that much. Okay, these parallel plates would have to be 10 centimeters apart. All right, and you'd have to have the whole thing in a vacuum because electrons won't travel very far before they get stuck to uh, a, a, an air molecule or something like that. Okay, and so of course then they wouldn't hit the plate. And then for your source of electrons, you could just simply boil them off of like a tungsten filament, like a little light bulb filament in there, and these electrons would then just like 
literally pop off the surface of the uh, material with not that much energy. And as soon as they feel the electric field between these um, uh, the the two parallel plates, there they would start to you know speed up and then slam into the uh, uh, slam into the positive plate. And by the time they're slamming into that positive plate, okay, even though they've only traveled seven centimeters, because electrons are that light, they will have acquired a speed of five percent of the uh the speed of light so yeah you know this is that is pretty fast it is doable in the lab in fact not only was this doable in the lab this was done every day in in common households when we used to have the old crt the cathode ray tube uh, televisions okay these were the uh the big television